Hi everybody, this is Pam, Flower Patch Farmhouse, and today I'm going to show you how I get a barn wood look, a faux look, and I do it with uh, acrylic paints and some chalky finish paint. Now to first get this kind of base color, and you can see the grain, so it's like a stain or a wash, and I mix equal amounts of folk art burnt umber and bleach sand. This is Deco Art Americana bleach sand or colors similar. Um, this adds a little gray tint to it, even though you wouldn't think it does. And this is the darker color, but barn wood isn't always real, real dark, and it's not super brown. It can have a little gray in it. So you kind of go with what you're looking for. You can go with a dark stain. I have many times, which is really nice as well, especially when you use a crackle medium. After the, that finish has dried, I mean, I paint on, it's very liquidy, with a paintbrush, the finish, I wipe it off with the rag, it absorbs pretty quick in raw wood. But um, the, e the finish is, is very even. And if you want some areas darker, you rub in a little bit darker area. And later on, I'll show you how you can darken some areas too after we sand some of this. But on this project, I used some Delta Crackle Medium. All of the major manufacturers, Deco Art, um, folk art, when it's by Plaid uh, and Delta, they all make a crackle medium, and I'm sure other manufacturers do as well, like Martha Stewart. Um, they all work pretty much the same. Some people like to use white school glue, and that can work too. That's a little more, um, it's not as trustworthy, so I prefer going with a regular crackle medium for some of, most of my projects. I have used glue, and it's turned out okay, but I can't always predict how it's going to react. Now for the crackle medium to put on it, because I don't want the crackles all to just one one direction, if I paint the crackle on this way, it the, most of the cracks will just run straight up and down. If this way, they'll go horizontal. But I kind of do it like this and just mix it in there so it kind of goes all over. My favorite way to do it is with a foam roller brush and just roll it on, but I didn't have one, so I couldn't do that today. So you put the crackle medium on with your slip slap strokes. I only do it in certain areas. I don't do it all over the entire board. So that's where we are now. The crackle medium has dried, and now I'm putting on my Deco Art Chalky Finish color in Heritage. The background's going to have some orange to it. And I have a, let me grab my big brush. I put it over there to rinse it out. And I put a little on the plate only because this brush is too wide to fit in to the can, that little jar. So here is my palette full of the paint. And then I'm gonna put it on. I'm gonna start way at the top and I'm just gonna run down the brush will run out of paint, and I let it because this is going to be, like I said, a, like a barnwood finish. And you don't want to overwork it because the areas of your board that have the crackle medium on it, once that crackle medium is activated, it will pull back up. And you just work along. Now, after this dries, I will sand it a bit so the edges are going to blend in with each other where it's kind of hit and miss. And you decide how much you want to coverage and how much show through of the wood. And I'm going along. Let me slide this within your view. I had already painted the other end because I started this video and made a big mistake and had to start over. So. I started on the other end to show you. So basically that's it. You see how there's lots of gaps? You can, like I said, make as many or as few as you want because you can always come in and sand down a lot of it. If you wanted to make like worm holes and whatever, you can take a small nail and kind of pound it in part way and then pull it back out um, after you get this finish on. And then how I darken those is I'll take a Q-tip with a dip it in a little bit of dark inky, maybe black or a dark um, burnt umber. And I'm going to show you something here. I know I'm going to finish this. Tape. And then I just put it on that little hole with the Q-tip. Can you see right there? That is some of the 
crackle medium that has been activated and it pulls up when I go back over it. You kind of want to avoid that. I could even that out with a sander, but you really, if you want the spaces that are just crackle, and I should have a further back view, but I've got a big lens on this camera right now. And so let me stand this upright and then I'll show you what the entire board looks like and you'll have an idea of what you're going for. Be right back. Well there, hope you can see it now. This is the finish before it's, it's drying still, so the color may change a little bit, but you can see how it's streaky and some of the wood's showing through. And then um, after a bit, when it's dry, I will sand it and then we will do some more. I'll get in closer so you can get a little closer look of it in the natural light. Why did it do that? Oh, this okay, just briefly, here's a closer up shot. The, the darker orange is still the wet part, and the other is dry, and then the wood underneath. Now the paint has dried, and I've sanded with a uh, palm sander that I have. I don't know if you can see right here, there's a little bit of the crackling that caused a crazing effect. Um, not a lot of the undercolor came up and you can see what sanding I did do brought out a few lighter places. Now the edge, if that's too light for you and you want that to be a little bit darker, I'll show you what I do. Let me get a little moisture on my rag. Yes. I have a paint rag and I have a little burnt umber here and a tiny bit of black and I just work my rag in it. I get it really inky. I don't want it very dark. I, I, I want it very transparent, almost just like a stain too. And you can just go along and rub that in on the edges and it darkens it and you work it in so it doesn't have a definite line. And you just get that into the you darken that along there and if it gets too or it's not leaving it dark you can change where it's at or get a little bit more on your rag and you just rub that in and if there's any like spots you want darker you know in here you can just go along with it as well if you get it a little bit too dark dampen the clean part of your rag and you come along and kind of take it back up you're not going to be able to get all of it back up, but you will get some of it, and you can lighten it that way. Or, if you really hate it, and you've made a big boo-boo, just take the sander to it and sand it back down. But it'll give you a, a measure of different shading in the wood, kind of like barn wood is all kinds of colors. Also, if you sand barn wood a lot, you will get down to a lighter color. The surface is really what's oxidized and become that uh, unique color of barnwood. And if you want to add wormholes, I just have a nail here. Hopefully that didn't hurt your ears. I'm going to do it again, so hold on. And I just kind of work it so it kind of broadens my little hole. And then I have a Q-tip. I've already gotten a little bit on it. It's been moistened so it's kind of translucent and I have a little bit of brown, a little bit of the black on it. And I'll just go and make a little circle here around there because nail holes, they darken from the inside out. I've got a bunch of black on my fingers. And then I'll let it dry a little bit. It's probably not dried long enough, but and then I just kind of dab it or I rub it a little bit and it kind of fades it, but it makes kind of a little nail hole, not nail hole, worm hole look, and that's darkened over time. You can also sand back over that if you don't like how it turned out, and uh, that's it. You could beat the board with chains, you can scratch it with things. Um, I don't find it necessary because once you have your design on it, all of that kind of fades into the background. If you have a measure of a worn appearance like the, you know, the dried paint that's been sanded and 
and crackled and all that. Um, any extra is kind of superfluous. So, all right. So I will transfer my pattern on it and we'll come back and I'll show you how I do my lettering. As you can see here, I don't um, use a stencil. If I'm just doing a one-off of a sign, uh, a stencil of this size can be quite expensive and really what's the point when it's very easy to print it out in like a Word document or whatever and then just lay it out. You can transfer the letters to the board. I use graphite paper. Um, because I'm going to be painting the letters a white or a creamy white, I'm going to transfer the pattern with a white graphite paper. And you'll notice that I laid out the letters to measure and see if how they would fit upon the board. The length of this board is five feet. I could have made it longer or shorter, but it was the size of board I had. Um, and then I set my letters out. These letters I spaced where the next letter would start approximately an inch from the lowest part of the previous letter. And I fold it over the paper. Before I tape all of these together, I'm going to cut this off and tape it to the other paper. The reason I'm, instead of just folding it and leaving it, is when I go to transfer it, the thicknesses of the papers will make it harder to make transfer the lines to follow for my lettering. Um, this size fits this board fairly well, so I'm going to go ahead and leave the letters one inch apart. You can space them a little bit further if your board is longer and you want it to fill up more of the board um, and whatever. So this looks good to me. I'm going to go ahead and cut my papers, tape them together and then transfer my design. I will come back and uh, show you how I transfer with the graphite paper. Now what I'm doing here, you notice I have it taped. I've taped it to the board after I kind of eyeballed it centered. I don't always measure everything, um, but I did go back and double check and I did have it centered where it's two inches to the lettering from the outside of the board. Now I'm just sliding my graphite, this is my white graphite paper. You see I've got other stuff on it that I, where I've used it before. That's the back and that's the front that's going to leave the white marks to follow when I paint. I'm going to very carefully slide it under where I want to draw on it. And it can be kind of a pain if it's too tight, but I've got it under the actual letter. And then I come in and I trace over. I have found that a pen, a sharp ink pen, does better than pencils as far as making the transfer. And I will show you pretty much what that looks like. And you can see where it's left the white lettering on there to follow with my paintbrush. Now, down here where the A overlaps the paper or for the H, there's uh, a double layer of paper there still. I could have cut the uh, H up from underneath paper so that this was less of a layer here, but I'm just gonna go ahead and leave it and then just use extra pressure when I try to transfer through the double layer of paper. You might have to really give it a lot of pressure there if you um, are half blind like me anymore and you need to really see well. Some people actually don't use the graphite paper they come in and they just trace right on here with the pen using extra pressure that leaves an indentation in the wood. Um, I can't see that very well. My hand starts to hurt very easily from having to push so hard. So that just doesn't work for me. But if you want to give it a try, it'll save you from using graphite paper. Um, like I said, I'm using the white this time and rather than a dark graphite because I'm going to paint the letters white, the darker graphite would show through that white or light colored paint. So I'm going to go ahead and transfer the rest of my letters on and then I'm going to come back and show you how I paint the lettering. Here I'm going to start the lettering. I am going to do this in DecoArt Americana color of buttermilk. I wanted something less white than pure white or titanium white. 
or at least I think I do, we'll put some on here and see what I think. Now I dampen my brush, get a little water on my brush, because I want to make the paint a little more inky. This is when I outline sometimes for crisp outer edges. I don't always outline. In fact, I'll come back and show you how I sometimes go straight from the brush. But here it just gives you a straight, crisper edge sometimes than just a paintbrush, a flat brush going in. I need to wet a little bit more. I have my tub of water just a little too far out of reach. I need to move it closer. And I just outline the letters. All the way along. It does not need to be exact because a lot of times I'll come back and sand a little bit around the edges or on the lettering to age that. So a lot of that just blends in. So I will get another brush. It's a bit wider. I think a three quarter inch brush. Let me see if I have a clean one close by. If I was with it, I would have had one all ready to go. These all seem to have a bit of sizing in them. I'm going to need to rinse one out. Oh no, this one just looks good. Now, you like a nice crisp edge for these, I mean, I mean on your paintbrush, so make sure this one's a little bit worn. And you see having a wider brush makes a broader stroke so it can make it go faster. And you see how I'm following along the edge there. Now if I have it already outlined, it's easier, or at least it's, I don't know, more comfortable. Just coming right in, and you see I went over that line, but it goes a little bit faster. I don't try to be quite so precise along the edge since I already have it edged. And it's easier for little corners like this if it's already outlined. But, like I said before, it's not absolutely necessary to have it outlined. And that's how you fill in. I will get a better brush, three-quarter inch brush, and I will come back and maybe show you um, a few more if I think I need to. I will show you a little bit more of the outlining. I changed to a longer liner brush. It just, it holds more paint so it strokes uh, longer before I have to reload. So here I'm following the lines carefully. It's not going to be perfect as I mentioned before and I just And every now and then I get a little bit more water to add to my puddle of paint on my palette because it just makes it flow easier. Going right over that line. Until I have completed the entire letter. And then I will go on and do the T, which is the last one to outline. And I will be back and show you how I'm going to fill in a bit more. I'm going to demonstrate once more about the filling in after I've outlined. Um, the brush I did with the H, that was a one inch, and I thought it was awful bulky, and I couldn't figure it out until I went to rinse it out and realized it wasn't a three-quarter inch. It was just a little too big. Even though it fit the size of the letters, sometimes it's hard to maneuver larger brushes. But here I am, I'm just going to go in. This is, is an actual three-quarter inch brush, and it's just a little easier to get into tighter areas, but still cover very well. And again, this is the Deco Art Americana Buttermilk color. Um, I probably could have done a white, and the orange coming through would have made it a little more less stark white, but I went ahead with the buttermilk. Buttermilk, I think, too, would give it a little bit more opacity. That's just my personal opinion. I don't have any proof of that. But Now, to do areas that are narrower than your brush, you can angle it, and then it won't take up so much of the space or go over the outlining. 
and you just fill in as you see need to be. It won't be completely even. There'll be areas that you'll see are a little bit thicker with paint than others. And that's okay because you come in and sand to distress it a little bit and it evens it out. Now I know you've mentioned this before, but you know a stencil for this would work great. And you may think that doing it by hand like this is more tedious, but actually pouncing in the paint for a stencil and going back and filling in the bridges can also uh, be quite time consuming and then preventing the, the paint from um, going under the edges and bleeding can be ch challenging as well. But I do like stencils. I've used them a lot when I was um, doing signs that had the same saying, doing a lot of painting of custom signs for people. And a lot of people like the same quote or saying. So that would, it made it worth it to pay for a stencil in those cases. But if I'm just doing a one-off, I just do them by hand because it's not worth the added expense. By the time I paid for the stencil, you know, the price of the sign would be so exorbitant. People have our time buying it. So there's the A. I can go back over the lighter areas once the paint has dried because um, if you keep going over it wet on wet, sometimes it pulls up the paint. And that is how you fill in your lettering. Now I'll go back, um, I'll turn off the camera, I'll go in and finish filling in, and then I'll come back and I'll show you how I add some like fly specks and other aging techniques. And I'll see you then. Now sometimes you can make a real mistake that you want to fix right away. Say, I'm trying to do this and I come way out past the line or a little bit out of the line that I want. In that case, I take a clean painting rag that I have. There's a painting rag, you see my finger in there. I'm gonna dip it in some water, clean water, kind of squeeze it out so I don't want it too damp, too wet. And, and I just go along and I clean up that edge with it. While the paint's still wet or relatively wet, it will come right up. In fact, a little bit of the orange came up, but that's not a big deal because you want it to look faded in spots anyways. So that is how you fix some little mistakes you make along the way if you get out of the line and what have you, or if you splatter paint in an area you don't want. I've done that many times or dropped my paintbrush so that is how you can quickly fix your error. So now we're going to add some more texture, I guess, or dimensions with fly specking, it's called. So I have an old toothbrush and I have used burnt umber. I got the toothbrush wet, worked it in and made it like an, an inky consistency. Now this can be very messy, but I do it with my finger and you just pull back on the bristles do it carefully because you can get some pretty big spatters. And um, I try to do it when it's drier. I mean, the sign board is drier. That way, if I really hate it, I can kind of wipe it in a little bit and then go over it. I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's some fly specking in there on top of the letters. Um, a lot of times I would have waited till after I had sanded the dry letters, but these are still a little bit damp and I wanted to show you while I could. And you could also go back in to add the lighter color. There, you should be able to see the little brown specks right there. Um, it uh, creates some dimension and some texture. Also, I would come back with the buttermilk color in my paintbrush. You can see what a number it does on my finger now. And then I would speckle maybe a little bit of the background. And then that adds that little bit of texture to that. And that is how you get that little bit of vintage touch. A lot of times, I mean, I didn't this time, but <clears throat> many times I would have waited until after I had sanded the lettering. It's gotten dry enough. I can go in, take it over to the garage and sand it a little bit. Or since I'm not going to be doing a lot, I have a little sanding sponge here that I can take to it and sand the lettering lightly. Let me show you here. I got my sanding sponge over here. 
this one's pretty worn, so I just add a little. This is a 100 grit, and since that's still wet, I will pull my sign this direction somewhat. You can see this one has the speckling, but it's dry on there. And I'll wrap this around. I wrapped it around my little sponge, and I just I go with the grain of the wood, and I just sand lightly, and it just kind of blends everything together. So you wore off a little more of that paint, you blended in the speckling, which this these were ones I had tried to video before, and my cart was full, and I didn't know it, and it kept shutting off on me. And so it also has a little more speckling than I had intended or would normally put on, but that is because I was retaking and retaking the video. And you can see how the sanding lightens it a bit. And I will get a clean rag to wipe off the sanding dust because it's getting the orange into the buttermilk color. And you see how it blends the paint down. When you're painting on, you'll have ridges of paint your let when you paint on your lettering and that kind of takes the ridges down and ages it all a little bit blends your paint in and here's the A. You see that the cross piece there doesn't have a lot of paint on it as far as making it opaque but that's okay. And you see how this knot is kind of coming up as I sand so it adds to the vintage look. I hope that sandpaper sound isn't too loud on the camera. But, and there you have your sign. And there'll be a full shot of the entire sign. And I think that's pretty much it for this. Um, I would go over it with a matte polyurethane to, for putting it outside for a very long time period of time and that's it. I hope you enjoyed how you hand letter a sign without using a stencil and you just like I said print it out with a word software or something similar. I will actually have this lettering up on my website. You can download it and make your own harvest sign. So be sure and check on over there at flowerpatchfarmhouse.com to get a copy of that if you want to make your own harvest sign. Okay, until next time, this is Pam at Flower Patch Farmhouse.